Hey everybody, this is Mark Bunting, the lead pastor of Emmanuel Church here in Salisbury. And I want to welcome you and thank you so much for joining us for our online church platform today. It's so good to have you. Hey, listen, our mission here at Emmanuel is to engage everyone everywhere. And one of the greatest ways that you can help us do that is by participating with the online chat today. We have our eChurch volunteers ready to pray for you, uh, ready to talk with you, ready to see how we can best connect with you. So make sure you participate on the online experience today. Again, thank you so much for joining us. We hope you have a great experience. I want to get right into it today. I don't want to waste any time. Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 20 is where we are headed today as we are excited about Vision Sunday. Raise your hand if you're going with the Rams tonight. Raise your hand if you're going with the Bengals. Oh, we got some Gerald Burrow fans in the house. I always love reality says the Rams. But, 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 but the underdog in me says Joe Burrow, Joe Burrow and the Bengals. Okay, anyway, enough of that. Ephesians chapter 3, two verses. This is really the theme for the year, also the theme for vision in general. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. Can you all tell I've had a little time off? I'm fired up to get back at it today. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20, it says this. Now to him who is able to do, here it comes, immeasurably more than we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work in us. Verse 21, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. I want to speak to you just for the next few minutes, and I'm going to have you out of here, a message entitled, Measuring for More. Measuring for More. Let's pray together. Father, thank you, Holy Spirit, for what you have done in this house already. Thank you for the people of God who have gathered today, even in the midst of them saying the, the most terrible words a pastor could hear on Sunday, for Sunday, snow. And uh, thank you for gathering the church at 9 and 11 as we focus around this day to kind of give clear direction of where you are calling us as a church body. And so, Lord, we ask today, more than any other time before, give us eyes to see, ears to hear, a heart that is soft to receive what, what is going to be said today. God, give me the capability and the words, God, what is burning in my heart, what you have been doing and how you have been leading. Lord, Help me to accurately communicate to your people today. Thank you, God, for what you want to do in your church. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, come on, and all God's people said, turn to your neighbor and tell them there's more as you're seated this morning. Yeah, 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 there's more, there's more, there's more. There is more. Anybody own one of these things? Y'all see the measuring tape? Uh, I have one in my house that does not mean that I use it because I really don't know what to do with it. I don't build anything. There's no sense in measuring. Uh, some of you men got measuring tapes. You know how to use it. I don't. However, we do own one, and it gets more use from my kids than it does from us. I mean, for my kids, this isn't a tool. It's a toy. And so, so uh, we have one of these in our house, but we never really use it. And just a few weeks ago, Sarah and I went to go measure a, uh, a curtain uh, in the house. We got to get some, some measurements for it. And we walked in uh, to, go, to go into the garage to get it. And uh, we picked it up. But we noticed something was different about it because it didn't have the metal piece on the end. My kids got playing with it, y'all. And they broke the end out of the measuring tape. Turn me down just a little bit if you hear, just, just a hair. They turned, they, they, bit, they, 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 they messed up the end and they, the metal piece was gone. And it's a broken measurement. You can't do a whole lot with a broken measurement. Isn't that true? And so I tried to do the best that I could. But we, we had to guess instead of having a, a true guideline on what to do. Because it's hard to find a correct measurement when you don't even know what you're measuring with. 
You don't even have the true guidelines you're going you're gonna to go by. Can I ask you a question today? Let me ask you this. As the church, how do you measure mission? And what I, what I mean by that is how do you measure the mission of the church? How do, you, how do you actually measure if what we do is successful? What are the standards that, we are at, that, that we're going by to make sure that what we are doing is what God designed us to do? But can I, can I be truthful right from the onset of the very start of the service? I believe when it comes to the church, there is some change that has to happen in the church because a lot of believers are using broken measurements. And what should be used as a a tool, a lot of the church has been toying around with. Instead of strict guidelines and measurements of what God wants to do, a lot of churches have been guessing on how to measure the mission. And the reason why they have been guessing is because when it comes to measuring, there has been a conflict between our culture and his kingdom. That needs to be clarified in the church. Can I break it down real simple for you guys? We don't measure the way the world does. The way that man measures and the way that God measures are two completely different Things And we are, if we are not careful, we will confuse the measurements of what culture says and mix it in with the church and use the measurements from the world and put it inside the church body. But I got news for you today. God doesn't measure things by the height of it. He measures things by the heart of it. God doesn't just measure things by the way they look. God measures things by what's in the heart of what you are truly made of. And so what we got to do is we got to start setting some standards biblically. What is the measurement of mission as we look at the church moving forward? You can't always go by measurements of uh, about what some people say. Because a lot of Christians, you know what they'll do with the church? They'll measure mission by people. And what I mean by that, what I mean by that, the first thing they ask you is is how many people are in your church? Now, every once in a while, I'll go to to like a pastor's conference or I'll be invited to get with a group of pastors to talk and to dialogue about culture, about about ministry. And And it's so funny because when you get a group of pastors in the same room, you know, the most humble people on the face of the planet where there are absolutely no egos involved. It's amazing to me how you can get around a group, a group of pastors and they start talking and the first thing they start saying is, uh, how big is your church? You know what they're doing. They're measuring you up. They're trying to see what ministry is, measuring it up by, by people. But here is the truth today, folks. You can't always go by people. Because I've seen small churches become more effective than large bodies of believers. Now, please hear me today. Anything healthy grows. But you can't always measure the mission of the church by people. I tell you what else you can't measure it by. You can't measure it by the presentation of the gospel. You can't measure mission by, wasn't this cool today? You got, look at that big screen and the cameras and the lights and the, and the sound systems and all, all of that, all of those were effective tools to engage the culture with the gospel. But you can't measure ministry by presentation. Because if you only measured ministry by presentation, what about the churches in China today who were gathering underground while everybody's skiing up above in the Olympics because they are persecuted for their faith. They can't even proclaim the, the, the name of Jesus out in the open air. Right now, they are being persecuted in China. But yet, guess where the gospel is growing the fastest, people? It's in places like China and Pakistan and in the Middle East. You can't measure mission, mission based off of presentation of gospel. I tell you where else you can't measure mission for a church. You can't measure it by programs. 
You can't measure it. You can't measure it by, by kids' ministry. Didn't it feel good, parents, dropping your kids off today and say bye-bye for the next hour? God bless you. You take them for as long as you want. I'm going to get this coffee. I'm going to sit in this pew, and I'm going to relax for a few minutes. Outreach ministry, kids' ministry, small groups, all of that is great, but you can't measure the mission off of programs. Now, hear me. People matter. Numbers matter. Why do numbers matter? Because every number is a name, every name has a story, and every story matters to God. So don't be fooled. We don't worry about the numbers. The presentation of the gospel is very important in reaching the context of the culture in which we live in. Programs are important. All three we place importance on, but here is the thing that I want you to get. You measure mission, are you ready? By purpose. Because here's the thing. You can have people, you can have the right presentation, you can have all the programs, but if there is no Christ-centered purpose, if there is no God-ordained mission, then there is a serious problem. So what I want the church to do is to check our measurements to make sure we are measuring the mission the right way. Now, I'm not sure if you knew this or not, but Jesus had a mission. Jesus came with a purpose. And what we need to do as the church is this. We measure our mission with what Jesus did. In other words, our purpose should come from his purpose. And Jesus made his measurement of mission very clear in the context of Scripture. He says in Luke chapter 19, watch this. In Luke chapter 19, Luke chapter 19, go to it. It says this. It goes this. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which is lost. So the mission, Jesus says is the kingdom of God has come down into the earth to reach people who are far from God. And as Jesus lives out this mission in the earth, he dies, he is raised again, and then after he lives out and models the mission, he then commissions the mission to all of us. Because in Matthew chapter 25, I believe it is, uh, Matthew chapter 28, he says this, Therefore, this is the Great Commission. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Next verse. And teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Now, here is the thing. Jesus' mission was just not coming for the lost, but it was also compassion for the least. Because later in Matthew chapter 25, he, would say, he says this. These are words in red. That means Jesus said it himself. For I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison and you did not look after me. They also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? He will reply, I tell you the truth, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. So Jesus gives the measurement for our mission. You want to know what Jesus' mission was? Are you ready for it? Are you ready for it? Write it down. This is going to help you. Jesus' mission is to reach the lost and help the least. This is the kingdom of God. This is what he came to do. Reach the lost, help the least. Now in January, just last month, I celebrated 22 years of full-time ministry here at this church, 22 years. I, I look pretty good for 25. I started young. I've seen, a lot, I've seen a lot of things over 22 years. A lot. But I've come to know this about ministry. God will move mightily in any body of believers who makes it its mission 
to reach the lost and help the least. And if we want to see God do immeasurably more, we've got to make sure we are measuring the right way and that we're all mission with what he wants to do. I'm going to be honest with you people. My heart has been stirring. All fall it was, it was stirring. And God began to deposit the word that I want to do more. I want to do more work. I, I want to do more work. I, I want to reach more people and I want my people to come along and do it. Now the Apostle Paul, in the book of Ephesians, the Apostle Paul had a purpose. His mission that he measured by was Jesus' mission that he, uh, he commissioned everybody for. Paul's purpose, Paul's mission was to take the gospel outside to the Gentile nations and preach Christ crucified, raised again, and salvation has come to all. And he planted churches in all kinds of different places. And, and, and the gospel began to spread. And one of those church plants was the church of Ephesus. And in the book of Ephesians, he's writing the believers and he's encouraging the body of believers. He's giving them hope. In Ephesians, the first three chapters, he begins to talk about the grace of God that has been given not only to the Jew, but to the Gentile. He's talking about the love of God that has been given and made everyone alive for everyone who calls on his name. Then at, at Ephesians chapter 3, about halfway through, he gets excited and he starts to pray for the church of Ephesus and he gives this beautiful prayer. And at the end of his prayer, that is the context of our scripture. In Ephesians chapter 3, 20 through 21, he gives this great prayer to the Ephesians. He's doing this amazing thing. And then he gives these two verses we read today. It is known as a doxology. Do you all know what a doxology is? Doxology means a song of praise. Isn't it fitting that as Paul is writing the people and he's on purpose and he's on mission and he's trying to reach people and he's trying to encourage the church and he prays for them, he busts up in a song of praise. You know why I don't blame Paul for doing it? It's because when you are living for the right purpose, you can't help but praise God. When you got the right motives of mission and the way you are living your life, your heart can't help but be moved when you pray for lost people and you help those that are the least, your soul can't help but sing. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise, I started too high, the Son and Holy that's a doxology in case you didn't know that. So he begins to bust out the doxology, and that's what we see in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. Here is his doxology. He starts with this. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we all ask or imagine. Paul is declaring the doxology over the church. And he says... That God is able to do immeasurably more than we ask or imagine. Check this. God wants to do greater than our words can say and our minds can see. But that in and of itself, people, is the problem. The reason why the church, capital C Church, y'all feeling me? The church is not seeing immeasurably more is because we've stopped asking and we've stopped imagining. We find ourselves in a complacent place where we get comfortable and we don't want to move. That's the first thing I want to talk to you about. I want to talk to you about feeling comfortable. Now, how many believe our God is able, our God is capable, and our God is willing to do immeasurably more? If you agree with that, here is the thing. Then why is the church settled for less? 
I'm going to tell you why. We have settled for less because we want to sit in the zone. And what I mean by zone, I'm not talking about the ozone. I ain't talking about auto zone. It's Super Bowl Sunday, and I'm not even talking about the end zone. I'm talking about a zone way worse than that. You know what I'm talking about? I'm talking about the comfort zone. I'm talking about boundaries, limits, lines that we sit back and settle in and stay behind because it is the place I am most comfortable with. A lot of people will not move out of their comfort zone. But what you fail to see is when, when you can't get outside of your comfort zone, what you are communicating is this. Where I'm at is good enough. The place I am in is plenty, and I'm staying right here. But what, what you fail to see is that with your own boundaries, you are the one that is bound. You have locked yourself in, and you have limited God because you have settled with good enough. And that's what, to be honest with you folks, that's what this church could have done in the midst of COVID. Because I'm going to be honest with you, in 2020 when COVID hit, everybody kind of looked at each other and said two things. Number one, how, how does a ministry even keep going when the people can't gather? And the second thing is this, how can we help people? who are dealing with COVID and everything that's going to come with it, with people losing jobs and people hurting and people needing things, people struggling to get through it, people that are scared. How does the church bring hope to them when we can't even get in the same house? And we struggle. But I'm going to tell you, 2020, God did an amazing thing, people. I know it's hard to say. It's easier to say now than it was back then. God did an amazing thing. And not only did this church survive, but this church thrived in 2020. And not every church can say that. Not every church can say that. And here is the thing. We could have gotten to a place in 2020 when we survived and things were going good. We could have done what a lot of churches did. Where we're at is good enough. We survived. God's been good. Let's just stay in this comfortable place and not go anywhere else, not try anything else out. Let's just sit here until COVID ends. Did you hear that? We're COVID. We're just going to ride it all out and just be comfortable and stay in this place until COVID, until, until COVID ends. But this church didn't do that. You know what this church did? It, in 2020, it stepped outside of its comfort zone. You know, I'm going to tell you what it did. I'm going to tell you what it did. We helped more people in 2020 than any other year that we have in Amanda. We helped more people in 2020. We didn't even gather in this building. We were out front, handing boxes of food out, praying with people, believing with people. And I'm going to tell you what else it did. It opened our eyes to the new potential of reach people who are not just in Salisbury, but around the world and in different states. And when Sarah read those names, there are people watching from all over that we would have never reached if 2020 wouldn't have happened. And we were able to get cameras and do all kinds of stuff to take the gospel to them because we refused to stay in the comfort zone. What we fail to see is we cannot let COVID control us. I'm going to tell you why. I hate to tell you this. COVID's not going to end. Do you understand? COVID will not end. There will be another variant and another variant and another variant and another variant. It will not stop. And if we settle until it all stops, we'll never move again. So this church did not settle. We stepped out, and God did an amazing thing in the midst of us, because why would we settle for less when he died to give us so much more? He wants to do greater, and we can't stop now. So God did a great thing. But let me begin to ask you this question. What would happen if the people of God begin to get to a place where they ask and imagine again? If the people of God, what would happen if we began to ask and imagine what God would want to do through all of us to begin to pursue his presence and his purpose 
I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. When you begin to ask and you begin to imagine the more that God wants to do through us to reach lost people and help the least, we step out of our comfort zone. We begin to move. And when we begin to move, God begins to move. When we move, God begins to do immeasurably more. Why? Because he responds to faith. And then he finishes it off in verse 20, for part B, according to his power that is at work in us. In other words, this immeasurably more that God wants to do does not come by your own power. It comes by the work of the Holy Spirit's empowerment inside of your life. That this greater that God wants to do does not come by own human effort, but it is the empowerment, a supernatural empowerment by his power that helps it go. Here's what I'm saying. It is his power that he gives to his purpose. It is his strength that comes within to fulfill his calling. That's what I want to, the second thing I want to talk to you about before we get into it this morning. I want to talk to you about fulfilled calling. You see, a lot of people believe God can do more, immeasurably more. They just think God can't do more through them. I'm not called. I don't know enough. I, don't, I can't do all of those things. And so that's not, that's not me. That's not, it, let it be somebody else you're talking about in the church today, Mark, when you talk about reaching the lost and helping the least. Because really, I ain't got my stuff together. You should just be glad the ceiling doesn't cave in when I walk into the building. Because I ain't been at this very long. So what, what you are saying, you, you're afraid to step out in a calling. You're afraid to step out of your comfort zone, but it's different for you. Because your comfort zone is not, it's good enough. Your comfort zone is, I'm not good enough. I can't do it. I'm not called. But when you begin to, lit, to, to believe the lie of, I'm not good enough, I can't, you actually separate yourself from the power that can. Hey, here's the truth. You can't do it. I don't even know how I get up here and do this every week. I can't do it. But there is something inside of us that goes beyond us. It is the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit that gives us the power to fulfill the purposes and the calling he has for his church. And as God does a work in you, he does an even greater work through you to others. It's, you know what? You've all come in contact with this Holy Spirit that has changed your life. Some of you wouldn't even be in this room if it wasn't for the Holy Spirit coming into your life and cleaning you up and getting you to the point you're at, you shouldn't even be alive right now. You were addicted. Your marriage was broken. You were all over the place. You were all right. But it was the power of the Holy Spirit that came in and gave you a testimony that got you to the place you are in right now. And, and, and God has changed your life. Here is the thing. When God changes your life, he then uses you to change others' life. So quit waiting around and saying, somebody else is calling, it'll happen. Somebody else will do it. Somebody else will bring change. Somebody else will influence my workplace. Somebody else will do it in our city, on Delmarva, in our culture. Somebody else is going to do it. I got news for you today. Government can't bring change. Culture can't bring change. You know who brings the change? The church is the change all world is waiting for. Sorry, John Mayers. I'm not waiting for the world to change. I am the change that the world is waiting for. They are waiting on the church to bring change. To fulfill the calling God has called us to, make sure you measure it the right way. Why? 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 What are we doing it for? He finishes in verse 21 and he says this, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. The reason why he empowers us and he changes us is not so that we can build great churches or boast about our accomplishments. It is to give God glory in the church. I wonder if any people in the church that have been changed would stand to your feet right now and give him glory. 
for not only changing your life, but making you the change that the world so desperately needs. Come on. I dare you to lift your voice right now and declare, I am called on the count of three. One, two, three. I am called. You got to say it louder. Some of y'all going to root for Joe Burrow louder than that. On the count of three, I am called. One, two, three. I am. You are called. And I am called. And God wants to do more. Be seated. Because I'm just getting started. This is what we revisit every year. This is what we do every year. We revisit the mission and we talk about the purposes of the church and what we try to do with what God wants to do with us for the course of the year. We try to wrap it around one word. This year the word is more. And what we do is we go after, we set goals and we go after with the gospel and we expand ministry from this point moving forward. And we talk about with our generosity what is called the one campaign. The one campaign is from Scripture where Jesus leaves the 99 and he goes after the one to bring the lost in. And so what we do every year is we give above and beyond what we normally give, and we give to the one campaign for the expansion of ministry. This is what we normally give. This is our tithe. And then above that, we give to what's called the one campaign where we set goals, we give it a word, and we go after it, and we see expansion of ministry. And listen, God put in our heart to plant churches a few years ago. We couldn't have planned any church if it wasn't for the one campaign. The expansion we've seen online and all the other things we've done, we could have not seen it if it was not for the one campaign. Your giving, just last year, I want you to go back on social media, YouTube. If you were here last Sunday, you saw it, a recap of what you did just last year. The word was forward, and we did move forward. You gave over $265,000 alone to the one campaign above your normal giving. Come on, that's amazing. So I want you to go back and I want you to look at, I want you to go back and look at it and recap everything that happened last year because of your faithful giving to the, for the expansion of ministry to keep mission-minded, on mission, go back and look at it. But this year, the word for the year is more. Everybody say more. more. And uh, I believe God wants to do more. We tried to break it down into four things. I want to I break it down into four, four avenues for you that, that God really wants to, to do. And I'll, I'll progress it. Uh, as I go along, local, global, national, and uh, Emmanuel Network. I'll, I'll start with the first. Let's, we're going to talk about local. How many know last year, because of your faithful giving, we were able to buy our Adopt the Block building at 818 Benny Street? For those of you that don't know what, what, what our, uh, our Adopt the Block ministry is, it's probably one of the greatest outreach ministries I have ever been a part of on the face of the planet. Started just a few years ago, we went off of Church Street just trying to help people, anybody that needed help. We wanted to help food insecurity, so it started with just adopting just a few homes, knocking on the doors, how can we help you with food? And so we started that way, and one home turned into two homes, turned into a whole block, and two blocks, and three blocks, helping hundreds of people now (laughs) with food insecurities. But here's the thing, it goes beyond food. Food is simply a bridge. The tangible helps reach the intangible, the spiritual needs being to pray with people and to help people. It's turned into food and giving away beds, giving away furniture, helping with all kinds of different needs. And last year we talked about what it would look like if Adopt the Block was not just every other Saturday, but it was seven days a week, 24 hours, a place where people could go to find help, not just with food insecurity, but we could also give a place for people to go to find resources, to give a medical clinic for medical needs, uh, that it would be a retail grocery shop area. So instead of giving you a bag and some stuff I don't need for my family, you can actually come in and go through and pick what you need according to the needs of your family. It would also have a massive distribution food, boxing and distribution area that we could pass out. Some of you saw that. Here is the exterior. Put, uh, put the first slide up if you could. There is the exterior of what we talked about last year. Now, here's the thing. Everybody listen to me. This is a debt-free project. This is debt-free. So here's the thing. This project only moves at the pace of the people. It's the church. So last year, we were able to buy the building debt-free. But now this year, we got to turn to the renovation and the new construction that we want to do. 
Here is the exterior of the facility. I love that water tower in front. It used to be a water, water, uh, water treatment area, so we kept it as a landmark, and we put the mission on it and just kept it as, isn't that cool, like a monument? So there is the exterior of what it will look like. I, now, go to the floor plan. The next slide, you can kind of, now it's hard to see. I know it is. It looks like a bunch of blob squares. But there is a place where you can come in out of the planter box. You come into the main entrance. To the right, you can turn, see all those chairs. That'll be a gathering assembly area because here's the thing. It's not only going to be a community center or to help people during the week. It's going to be another church plant on Sunday. It's going to be another campus of Emmanuel on Sunday. Going to look different than here. It's going to look totally different. But we're going to be able to provide the spiritual need as well. Then you come in and you're going to be able to go into the office area. There's going to be meeting rooms, resources rooms, a medical clinic. Uh, all will happen on that end. If you come into the main doors and you take a left, there is going to be a retail grocery area for you to come in for families that need to pick specifically of what you need for your family. Then the back end is the new construction, just shy of 5,000 square feet of storage area that will contain a massive amount of food for food distribution that even goes beyond just our adopt box. Isn't that amazing? Come on, isn't that amazing? So here's the thing. Our first goal for the one campaign for, the, for this year, the one campaign is a one-year commitment. For this year, our goal number one, next slide, is our local, which is the Adopt-A-Block building, 818 Bennett Street, renovation and new construction. Once I said, like, like I said earlier, this, this dep is dependent upon you. At what pace do you want to get this thing done? And I believe God wants to do amazing things through that ministry and expand it well beyond what we have ever seen yet. Now we turn our attention to global. Did you know that the gospel is global? Did you know that this, this thing, this is hard for some of us, this thing right here was not written just for America. There are brothers and sisters worshiping around the world just like we are. And to be a mission-focused church on mission we have to think out of the context of our worldview in our local area. We got to think global. Just a couple of years ago, I was, had the opportunity on a, on a vision trip to go to Guatemala with Impacto Ministries. Impacto Ministries is a, an amazing ministry. This time last year, the leader, Luis Martinez, actually came here and he spoke. Some of you remember him, incredible man of God. They are, there's a hunger for the things of God in Guatemala. And Impacto Ministries is planting churches as fast as they can get them out, and they're seeing changed lives. They also have a feud insecurity ministry, a compassion ministry called Hungry Tummies, just like how we have adopt a block but they work with kids. It broke my heart when I went to Guatemala because they told us, when you see little kids running around and you notice that their hair is different colors, it's not because they went to the beauty salon and got highlights. It's because of malnutrition. So everywhere we went, we saw these kids with two-tone hair colors because they don't, have, they don't have food to eat. And so Impacto Ministries is reaching the lost and helping the least. And so we're going to continue to come on side, beside them. Now, here's one thing that they did. They started doing last year. They want to empower pastors and train pastors. They started a Bible institute because pastors are coming from the mountains of Guatemala. They've got nowhere to go to study God's word and to be trained. And so they come to Impacto Ministries, and they need a place to stay as they study God's word before they go back and reach more people. And so they're building these, these buildings to, for these pastors to stay in. And just last year, we were able to give some $25,000 away to help with one of their buildings. So here's two things that we want to do as we partner with, with, with Impacto Ministries. We want to help a church plant. And we also want to help the building of those buildings so these pastors can come and be trained so they can reach lost people. So goal number two, when we think of global, the, the second thing we're going to do with the One Campaign is we're going to support Impacto Ministries in Guatemala. But it doesn't stop there. But wait, there's more. There is also not local and global, there is also national. 
Now, some of you might remember if you've been around for some time, there was a youth pastor on staff here. His name was Todd Nicholson. And Todd was a, actually a friend of mine in college and came here to be the youth pastor. And, and uh, Emmanuel has always placed a high importance on youth ministry. Jake and Carly do such a fantastic job with our youth. <laughs> Knock it out of the park. The longevity for a youth pastor, most youth pastors don't stay around longer than a year or two. Uh, maybe, and then they're gone again, but we have seen a longevity of youth pastors. Jake has been here, I don't know, three, four years, something like that, four years. Todd was here for seven, and he left us and went to Skyline Church in San Diego, California, another huge prominent Wesleyan church. Then he went to uh, 12 Stone Church, our largest church in our denomination in Atlanta, Georgia, nine campuses. Todd was a campus pastor there, saw amazing things, but God began to tug on his heart for places that do not know Jesus in our nation. Out west, they don't know Jesus like we know Jesus. And so Todd and Micah felt the call to plant a church in Helena, Montana. They sold everything in Atlanta. Their home uprooted their three kids, and they they did what's called a parachute church plant. They just went into the area they don't know anybody to plant a church and to see God do something amazing. So one of our goals this year is national. We're going to help support. They're calling it, watch this, next slide. They're calling it Buffalo Church. Isn't that awesome? So we're going to help Todd and Micah plant that church. Now, if I could stop there, man, that'd be done. That's what I thought for the year. God spoke, is done, is finished. Thank you, Lord. That's a lot to accomplish. And, uh, but something began to stir in my spirit this fall, um, about mid-fall. The Lord started calling me into like deeper prayer times, and I didn't know um, what, the, what the Lord was doing. And he began to speak to say, I'm not done yet. There's more. And I didn't know what the to do because I'm kind of looking at what we're doing this year and that's some lofty goals for the people and uh, I just wanted to just stay you know right there and then um, something happened about um, late fall where God began to open a door now I don't know if you know this or not but there's something happening in Sussex County for all my Sussex County people of what I'm calling the Sussex County boom I mean, Sussex County, Millsboro East is blowing it out, people. I mean, people are moving from all over the nation. They can't build homes fast enough on the east side of Sussex County. It's just people. This population grows and grows and grows, and more and more people are coming, and that bothers me. You know what bothers me? Not because more people are coming here, because as the population grows, so does lost people. Who's going to reach them? With more population means we need more churches. Who's going to reach them? And it kind of tugged at my heart. It's been tugging at my heart because that's, that's the history of my family. My family is from, the, from eastern Sussex County, man. Homegrown. Good people. Sussex County. A lot of good things are, are happening over there. And you, you do know the history. If you go towards the beach, you do know the history and the heritage, right, of Rehoboth Beach and Bethany Beach. Did you know how they got those names, Rehoboth and Bethany? Those are biblical names, people. And they happened because God did a revival where, where people would come for rest and relaxation. They would have camp meetings and a place where God moved mightily among them, so much so that people started moving there and living. And they called it Rehoboth. They called it Bethany. And some amazing things have been happening down that way. And then late this fall, there was a door opened, as someone said, What would happen if Emmanuel planted a church in Bethany Beach? So sometimes you don't have all the answers. You don't know if you should step or stay back. So what we sort of started doing is just kind of taking a step forward at a time, a step forward, a step forward, a step forward. And God began to line some things up where we feel like God is calling us to plant a campus in Bethany Beach, Delaware. Put the next slide up.
Now, this campus is going to look totally different than what we do. It's a laid-back, culturally, it's a laid-back atmosphere. It's totally different than, than here, so it's going to be a, a more laid-back coffee shop, lounge type of venue where it is going to be video venue. It's going to be a satellite campus where we'll be streamed in and we're going to, by video, reach people. I know it might seem foreign to some of us, but it's happening all over the nation and people are responding to it and we're going to go into Bethany and try to win, and win more people. So if you're here and you're from Sussex County, if you're, if you're, from, if you're, from, if you're from Ocean View and Millville, if you're from Selbyville and Roxana, if you're from Rehoboth and the Bethany Beach area, stay tuned because we're going to be calling on many of you if you feel led to go be a part of this campus in the fall. We're shooting for the fall. The Lord has opened us to rent a space in a new a construction place in Millville just outside of Bethany that's going to be the hub that people are going to pass by right on the main road into Bethany that we're going to be able to access. And I believe God wants to do special things through it. Bethany Beach Campus. That's exciting, isn't it? So, let me show you uh, what's next for us. How, do, how does this work? Because I want you to see it. Are you sitting down? Good. <laughs> it's also going to help with all of our campus upgrades to make sure we're, we, we stay up to par. Um, there's going to be some technology stuff we're going to have to do to accommodate. So now that you're sitting down, let's talk about the goal. Last year we raised 265000 This is an audacious goal, guys. Um, what I'm going to share with you, we're, we're all going to have to be involved. We're all going to have to be involved. We're all going to we're all going to have to respond in some way. The goal is 625 down. Put put it up. 625,000, 650,000 dollars above our normal giving. See how quiet it got. <laughs> to the one came in. Let me tell you how it works. A minimum of 1,250 units giving an additional $10 above their tithe each week for one year. So let me show you how this works. This is your normal tithe. This is your normal giving. And then you give over here. For some of us, uh, it's, it's one unit, so you can do 10 extra dollars a week. Do you know what 10 extra dollars a week is over the course of the year times 52? $520. That's one unit. Does that make sense? Did y'all follow the math on that? Giving above to this, okay, for expansion of ministry. This is how it works. One unit. Some people do one unit. I've seen people do five units. Some of you do eight. Some people do ten and more because it, watch this, it is not equal giving. It is equal sacrifice. As we all give to be a part of this, to go above and beyond. So this is what we're going to do. We do this every year. We have Commitment Sunday coming up on Sunday, March 6th. Put, put it on your calendars. You're going to get a card when you exit today, or you can go on the website. You can find it online. As you pray through over the next three or four weeks, where is God leading you to give above and beyond for the one campaign for this year? And then Commitment Sunday, Sunday, March, that you're going to come in, and we're trying to work out the details here, but, but we're thinking Todd Nicholson will actually be in Maryland and will be here with us that day. That's going to be from Buffalo Church. We have one of the, the chairmen of the board of Impacto Ministries coming, and uh, we're going to pray. over. We're going to get those cards. We're going, to, we're going to pray. I'm going to preach. We're going to pray over those cards. We're going to come forward. We're going to commit them before God and watch God do something amazing. He does every year. Now, here's the thing. Some of you are like, I don't want to fool with 10 extra dollars a week. Blah, blah, blah. You know, let me tell you what some people do. The, the ones that have the means to do it, that commitment Sunday, they just write a check that day for the whole year for 1, 10, 8, 7, 17 units. I'm going to do it that day and get it over with. It's up to you how you want to do it as long as we all get involved. We, a church our size, people, I know it's post-COVID, and some people are not back, and they will not come back. But this goal is obtainable. 
but the people of God have got to go after it. And I'm wondering today, will you go on this journey with me? Now, I don't know what this looks like. I don't have all the answers. I don't know how it's going to play out. But I knew this. If we take steps of faith, God will lead us where he wants us to go. When he called Abraham, he said, follow me, Abraham. Great, where we're going. I'll let you know when we get there. (laughs) So now, let's go on a journey, Emmanuel. Let's see what God would do through us. And how out of our sacrifice, we can see other families restored. We can see kids coming to know who he is. We can see baptisms. We can see changed lives. We can see as the population of Sussex County grows, that we also would depopulate hell. Are you with me today? Come on. Stand to your feet now. If you're with me, if you're not, lie and stand to your feet anyway. I've been carrying, I feel so much better because I've been carrying this for a long time, people. And the weight and the burden of this has been so long. Now you get to carry the weight with me. Because here's the deal. This ain't my church. Do you hear me? This is your church. And how you respond is how the church goes. Amen? Let me pray with you before we go. Father, thank you for your people. It's a hard message to hear today. But Lord, I feel like we're, we're doing what your mission says. We're going after the lost and we're helping the least. We are praying and expecting for you to do immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine, God. What our minds have thought that you've put there, the words that we say through our prayers and communicating the vision, God, we believe that you can do even more than that. And we wait by faith expectantly as your church to see what you will do as you lead us into the future, Lord. Help us, help many of us to step outside of our comfort zones, to not be locked in or limited to what we see around us that you want to do so much more. Challenge our hearts over the next few weeks to see God's purposes come to pass, that the church would be on mission. Come on. If you're with me, would you just take a second and praise him right now already for what he's going to do. Amen. Come on. Lift your voices in praise today. We believe it and we expect it in Jesus' name. Come on. Would you sing for us, Pete, before we close out? Come on, let's worship together. Come on, Pete, sing for us. Hey everybody, thank you so much for joining us today for our eChurch Online. We're so grateful that you took the time to join us today. If you made a decision for Christ or need prayer, want to know just a little bit more about the church or your relationship with God, we'd love to connect with you. If you could text that number on the bottom of the screen, someone will be reaching out to you to see how we can best serve you. Again, thank you so much for joining us today.